Greetings friends, my name is John Gabriel and this is the new Calculus channel. So in the last two videos I described the abstract unit and in this video which I see as sort of the conclusion, uh, of course uh, I haven't discussed everything in these last three videos but quite a lot uh, and I'll have you know that a lot of this uh, information has been spread across many other videos in my channel. So I want to talk about Euclid and uh, what he thought about the unit and the abstract unit. So let's begin. Seems like I can't close the camera and now I have. And so let's begin. Uh, so we saw how the concept of unit is realized in geometry and then in algebra, of course, because algebra gets all the properties, inherits all the properties from the number concept, from the magnitude concept in geometry, which then becomes the number concept through the abstract unit. So as discussed in geometry there is no ideal unit but the unit can be randomly assigned a magnitude of size without even worrying about numbers right so you could you know take two points and you know automatically from the first requirement of euclid not axiom because there are no axioms or postulates in mathematics you know that there's a shortest distance between those two points so you could consider any one of those a unit so in algebra, an abstract unit is used which has no magnitude or size, okay? In other words, the size of the measuring stick or the measuring tool, whatever you want to call it in algebra, uh, inherits all the general properties of the geometric abstract unit with one exception that no size can be allocated. And of course, there are some uh, also exceptions in arithmetic which i'll get to eventually but homogeneous objects are used in geometry and in algebra also with the exception that the number type can be specified in context so for example you know we talk about uh, area in terms of number but if we want to know if we have 11 and 11 and we want to know which is area and which is volume then we write square units after one of the 11s and square unit uh, volume in cube units after the other. So this is very different from physical measure, okay? Physical measure uh, is when the type is given following the number. So for example, you have three and a half feet, six kilograms, eight cubic centimeters, etc. The important property, the one important property is that is that is the most probably the most important property that is not carried over from geometry to algebra is that of exact measure. So you see, in physical construction, once we choose a unit size, uh, it is possible to be very accurate using our knowledge of geometry. So in our minds, for example, we can determine the value of uh, the constant pi times the constant root two exactly, and I mean absolutely uh, to the point where you can say it is the product and there is there is no error whatsoever so this is not possible in algebra and, and how how can we determine a pi times square root two well again i'm going to go or pi divided by square root two i'm going to go back to that example that i gave you about uh, equal angles subtended on the same arc in a given circle okay and I've explained how you can multiply any uh, magnitude by any magnitude or divide any mag magnitude by any magnitude using that particular knowledge. So I'm not going to waste time on it. And so there are certain operations that are effectively null operations in algebra. So what is a null operation in algebra? It's one where nothing actually happens. Let's see an example. In geometry, we can partition a unit, in, as for that matter, any other length, into any equal and any number of equal parts we like, right? We can partition any line segment into any number of equal parts we like. 
in algebra, this is not possible. Okay, so let's look at an example of a null operation in algebra. The number one-third, which you see here, one-third, uh, is supposedly derived from the operation one divided by three, but this is a null operation because uh, the obelisk, which is this symbol here, uh, means a certain process, okay? And I'll explain that process in a minute. But in this particular case, because 1 is less than 3, the numerator is less than 3, all that happens is that the 1 goes to the top of the vinculum. This horizontal line is called the vinculum. Uh, I'm sorry, this horizontal line, I can't get it there, but anyway, uh, goes to the top of the vinculum and the 3 to the bottom of the vinculum, and that means one third. So nothing actually happens here in algebra. Right, so that's a null operation. Then the measure of division, uh, which is this obelisk symbol, is not a null operation if the numerator of a given fraction is greater. So for example, if we have the number eight thirds, we could still uh, say the 8 goes to the top and the 3 goes to the bottom, but we can also do this middle process, which is the obelisk operation. Okay, in this case, the process of the obelisk operation is well defined and takes place in a fixed number of steps. Okay, there's no infinite subtraction or garbage like that. So you count the number of times 3, which is a divisor, can be subtracted from 8, which is a dividend, until one of two things happen. One, there is no remainder of subtraction after a given step, and there, or two, the remainder is less than the divisor three. Okay, so, so that's when you stop the process. It doesn't go on infinitely. So the fools in mainstream academia, when they say that one divided by three is 0 0.333 dot 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 dot, don't know what they're talking about. Okay, they don't understand measure, they don't understand radix systems, they have no clue what is happening. There are clueless baboons and orangutans, and they deserve to be called that because they're beyond correction. Now, what did Euclid think? Coming back to the subject of Euclid, okay, and the unit. So, Book 7 and Definition 1 of Euclid in the original Greek states, Mon, monas estin kath in ekaston ton ondon and laete. Okay, so, you know, in modern Greek, that doesn't even sound very meaningful, okay? Of course, somebody who, who knows ancient Greek will probably get more out of it, but according to Thomas Heath, uh, he translated it as a unit is that which according, is that according to which each existing thing or being is said to be one, okay? And of course, I think a better way of writing this ancient Greek definition would have been this one here, monas, ekaston, ton, ondon, and leete. But of course, that's not even a perfect definition because if you translate it, it says single or unit or one, each of the beings is called, okay? So it's very vague, very meaningless. It has no... Uh, opening for one to understand it easily. In other words, unless you study everything that came before Book 7, you won't know what it means. So, in Euclid's time, there was no special word for abstract. The Greeks of the time accepted that mathematics, and in particular geometry, was realized, in particular geometry, are realized concepts of the minds, okay? Anius to nous. Anius to nous. So, um, the modern Greek word used is perilipsi, okay, which can mean several other things. I'm sorry, I, I didn't say that right. It's perilipsi, okay. Actually, I did. But anyway, uh, because I don't speak Greek too often, I have to watch where I stress the words. So where I put the red font there, that's where you place the accent. In any case, that word perilipsi can also mean summary, synopsis, resume, and inclusion. It is therefore not strange, in my opinion, that Euclid didn't bother to explain more precisely what is the definition of a unit in Book 7 and, and Definition 1. I mean, his definition is completely vague. Some other translations are a unit is that by virtue of which all things are called one, as I discussed in the previous videos. 
So scholars of the time were aware of the context and were assumed to have studied the previous books that served as a necessary prelude to book seven. Needless to say, the majority of the stupid orangutans in mainstream academia, which includes many of the modern Greek academics today, did not realize, did not notice any of these vitally important facts. Otherwise, if they had, they would have known what is uh, an abstract unit, what is a perfect definition of number that covers everything, and uh, it would have been a very different path. And it, now it's not hard to find evidence for my claims. So I, I showed you that even Richard Dedekind was honest enough to admit that he didn't understand. And I could mention many others, such as Cantor, Cauchy, Hilbert, Wittgenstein, Russell, and the like. But it would be a waste of time because all of these people were fools who thought that they had found the solution. Incidentally, Dedekind also thought he had found a solution in D-cuts for his imagined real numbers. He didn't. Okay, so in my final example, I want to show you what even a mainstream, even that even when a mainstream academic comes close to truth, a miss by a little is as good as a miss by a lot. So there's this Professor Susanna Dansko's uh, video on number file in which she discusses Euclid's big problem. Actually, Euclid didn't have a problem. She had a problem because she's never understood the elements. So she does say something that is correct in the beginning. She says there is no ideal unit. That's true. But then she fails to realize that in algebra, there doesn't have to be an, uh, an ideal unit because algebra is the generalization of the measurement in geometry, in which case we use the abstract unit, what I've just been talking to you about in this video. That's why it's so important to understand these things. Um, on recent discussions in PsyDot Math, uh, uh, it's very frustrating because these so-called math academics who have been, you know, studying mathematics and like to think of themselves as mathematicians, they're not, any, they're anything but mathematicians, have no clue what it means to be a number, have no clue what, have no clue as to how to teach mathematics and do not know that in order for one to understand mathematics, one must understand the most important concept which is that of number, okay? If you do not understand what is a number, you'll never, I don't care if you you're, you become an expert or a master at partial differential equations or uh, uh, different levels of group theory and abstract algebra, you don't know mathematics, okay? You have to understand the concept of number, and that's why I have constantly come back to this concept because it is the root of so many misconceptions, misguided ideas, and wrong conclusions in mainstream mathematics. So if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, I encourage you to subscribe and to uh, click like on my videos. Remember, I am hated by the mainstream academia, so they will always try to vote my videos down so that people don't find them. And yet, uh, my videos are the best math videos on the web, even though they're not prepared beforehand. Everything I've done is always impromptu. So, in closing, I'm going to place a link to this presentation in the details section and hope that you'll be able to study it in your own time. This is a new calculus channel. I'm John Gabriel. Till next time, goodbye.